Hello everyone, and welcome to this training in coaching with WKO, lesson two, using WKO to better understand your strengths and limiters. This is the lesson two or the third part of this overall series. Um, just a quick note, lesson two, or lesson two, three, and four, which could be actually said as step two, three, and four, I kind of do them all at the same time. Again, I'm encouraging you to not use my process, but to create your own process. You can actually blend all these together. I'm going to teach them in the way that's most progressive to teach, but feel free to mix them up and design your own way. Today, we're going to talk about how to better understand your strengths and limiters. So let's jump right in, right? When you look at an athlete and you first get an athlete and that athlete comes to you with a goal, I want to win a national championship. I want to complete my first century. I want to do well in this grand fondo. I want to complete dirty Kansas, whatever that is, right? The first thing you need to do as a coach or a self-coached athlete is ask yourself, what do I need to know here to be successful in, in training this athlete to performance? Well, to me, uh, this really is about understanding the ability of the rider and the demand of the event. If you start with those two things as I need to understand those two and understand how they interact to create desired performance, your training strategy should all trickle down off of that. And I'm going to teach that over the next couple of lessons, right? This lesson is all about understanding the rider. So we're going to look a little more about the ability of the rider, obviously, but I have a slide about demand of the event, just understanding how, you know, we can look up some information. Ability of the rider, we're going to look at things like their power duration profile, their power durations metrics compared, their power profiles, and some strength weaknesses and limiters. I'm going to demo some of the charts that are in WKO, and I'm going to suggest maybe you look a little deeper and find some of your own. When you're starting to talk about demands of the event, you start with course demands, right? Both general and specific. A general demand might be it's 125 kilometers. A specific demand might be there's a lot of climbing and it's got two climbs, both of three, 400 meters, you know, something like that, both at 12% grade. So you have a general and a specific demand. You also have competitive demands. Who's in the race? How fast will the race be? Do I have to deal with teams or am I just trying to hit a certain time? What are the competitive demands of the race? You need to consider challenges and barriers, you know, um, and this can actually be something people don't think enough about. Like, where is the race? How long is it to get there? Am I gonna have all my stuff packed and ready to go and all that stuff, right? But also challenges and barriers, like maybe this event is your first century and you've never done a century. So that's a real barrier, right? You haven't gone that far yet. And then at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, how will I win or how will I succeed? Um, if I've never done a century, success might be just completing the century, right? And that defines the event goal. Just a good way to start your thinking. When I do this with an athlete, I keep notes. I'm kind of old school. I keep some index cards and I write like four or five index cards. And as I'm looking through the athlete and I'm seeing aha moments, like that's important, I write it down. So when I go on to what I'm going to show you in lesson three and five, actually, I think it is, you'll see where your notes come into play. So let's talk about the ability of the rider. Let's focus mainly on that for this session. So we have a profile dashboard within WKO5, which will really help you. Uh, all the charts I'm about to show you are here. I would encourage you again to add your own analytics, but this is a good starting point. To access that dashboard, click the small down arrow. You get this little UI right here. Select add an existing dashboard. This UI will pop up. Select dashboard library and search the word profile and then w click on the profile dashboard. That will load the dashboard you're seeing in this image. All right, let's just roll through what we're looking at in this dashboard. First, we have a power duration curve. The power duration curve is an excellent starting point because what you're seeing here in the red line is your actual power duration curve. The yellow line is your mean maximal power all over the time range. Not the best example. I have 30 days selected here, but Okay, we can live with that. I should have selected 90 for an example, but I think you'll get the point. And the dark lines are the database, our database, our WKO database of performance, ranging from world-class to exceptional to excellent, down to fair and recreational. As you hover or move the cursor left and right, you'll see these numbers change here. You can, compa you can compare your PD curve and mean maximal power curve against that database and see where you stand for any given time range 
within your data formats. So that's an excellent way to look at, wow, how do I compare here in the sprints? How do I compare here in the mid-range stuff? And how do I compare against long range? And that's simply a matter of moving the cursor left and right. Excellent way to start. Kind of like the old power profile, which we're still going to use and I have a slide on, but instead of only looking at four or five time frames, now you have all time frames available to you. One of the things new in WKO5 is we do have the ability, we have power duration metrics compared. And what you have here is just the core metrics of PMAX, FRC, and FTP. And we're comparing them against the database of users. So the reality is, here you see this PMAX is, and these are low, medium, high. They're pretty much right in the middle of medium. Their FRC is in the high side of medium and their FTP is on the high side of low. Now, as you begin to think about strengths and weaknesses and limiters of this athlete, right? This would be a strength and this would be a limiter and this would be neutral. It doesn't seem to be doing, you know, it's not necessarily hurting them, it's not helping them. This is hurting them, potentially limiting them, and this is a strength. So one thing, when you have strengths and weaknesses, right? I always look at it as strengths, things that can help me win weaknesses, things that are barriers to my performance, but a limiter is when one of my weaknesses is absolutely going to stop me from winning. Like um, the reality is I work with some well-known time trialists. Let's say that one of those time trialists doesn't have much of a sprint. Their five second power is really low. That's a weakness, but it's not really a limiter because that five second sprint really is going to have no impact on their target performance and goals. So I don't, I don't look at that weakness and say we have to overcome it. We might occasionally train it for overall benefit, but we don't have to overcome it because it's not really a limiter to the performance event that they want. So here you see a strength, here you see a weakness, here is neutral. This is a strength and weakness chart. And all this chart is doing is normalizing it to this, ath this athlete against the performance profiles. And don't worry about the numbers in this chart. These are the blue line is the actual athletes normal, their average. Each green line makes is a standard deviation above average. So strength one, strength two, strength three. And each orange red line is a um, standard deviation below the average strength one, strength two, strength three. So the way you're looking at this chart is if the curve goes lower, as compared to the database, that's more and more of a limiter. As it goes higher, it's more and more of a strength. So a super high curve up here, that's really a strength compared to the database. A super low curve, that's really a weakness compared to the database. You can see this athlete doesn't really vary that much. They're pretty much all within one standard deviation and they're pretty flat. They're an all arounder. And this athlete can do a little bit of everything. Jack of all trades, master of none. We also have a chart called against world class. And what this is doing is measuring your power duration curve against a world class numbers. So the world class numbers are in the first power duration curve um, that we saw on the first slide where I was showing these. But imagine that's just a flat line up here, flat line across. And the reality is this is how you measure as time as you go into the duration of your capabilities. So here at two seconds, you know, this athlete might be 65% of world class, but here at 40 seconds, they are 75%. Uh, I'm making it up. I can't scroll over, obviously, but you get my point. But way out here at five hours, they're only 50% of world class, right? So this gives you that in the red. The green dash is an age adjusted against world class. Now, this isn't individual to you. We just use a general decay, a general expected loss of aging. So just take it as observational data, something that gives you some insight into your performance. I would only use it if I'm 40 plus. As a matter of fact, if you're 15 or 18, it'll go under the red line because it age adjusts back up and down, right? Um, maybe we should limit it to only show us old guys and girls uh, 40 plus. But the reality is um, it does help give insight in some of the age adjustment for you. Finally, we have our classic power profile, how we compare our five seconds, one minute, five minutes and FTP. And again, um, you know, you're seeing different ways of looking at data and understanding what kind of their strengths and limiters are. Finally, when I'm looking at the athlete, right, I want to look at their training history. 
So in their training history, and why I want to do that is I want to establish that athlete's um, history because it's important when you start thinking about your training. What I'm really looking for is just understanding of how much they have trained or haven't and their training maturity, their number of years they've been training. I think a lot of coaches and self-coach athletes do not look, they look at a one-year cycle. I always recommend looking at a three-year cycle, um, maybe even a four-year cycle with younger athletes. You'll get much better overall insight from the athlete. So two great charts you can look at um, that are in the uh, training uh, dashboard is just their training history. And you could look at that over recent and expand it. And look at their PMC. Now this Joe Ryder athlete has some odd data mixed in it. Some of it's me, some of it's people I know. Um, like I know there's a whole bunch of dupes in here. But if you see an athlete that has that, they, you know, three years ago they had a huge CTO and now they've been dropped off, this and that. It gives you an understanding of kind of their history and what they can and cannot do. Okay, let's switch over to the other side of the coin, demands of the event. The internet is your friend. Um, internet research, what's really evolved, you know, I've seen racing from back in the days where you'd have to call people on that phone with the Coralie cord, remember those days? And be like, hey, dude, what's that race like out in California, <laughs> you know? Um, to now you can jump on the internet and basically look up course information, course profile. You can often find power profiles or power files ask around, does anybody have a power file from that race and this and that. And you can really do great in-depth research on the demand of the events. Also, a lot of athletes race the same event year in, year out. So don't forget their own history. Obviously, that's very powerful, right? Images. Don't be afraid to pull images. One of the things that's great is you can find um, all kinds of video these days on courses and, and races. And so many people use onboard cameras from you know, this race and that race. If you Google search them, a lot of times you get great pictures or great videos there. I would also look at start lists. Go back to the competitive demand, right? Who are you racing? Who typically races at this? Look at last year's start list. Look at last year's data. That will give you some really good insight of demands into the event. Okay, so let's talk about how I process this. Again, this is my process and what I do. And I actually write this down. I have a little, um, uh, document. It's actually a Google Doc that I just keep making copies of that I take my notes in. So I've been writing all my index cards as I'm looking through all this data. And this is where I start my first formal step. My, I'm very process orientated. If I don't write things down, I, you know, I'm always one of those guys who will defocus and go ride my bike and forget to capture everything. So when I'm looking at athletes, I really um, focus on it. And this is a four part effort that I do and I call it the data analysis cycle of you know a new athlete so first i just write the general demands of the event so i'm just going to give an example so i'm here at the 2019 uh, world's itt course doing some pre-work with one of my athletes so i'll kind of use that as an example because i'm learning the course and the athlete i know the athlete pretty well but while i'm here so the general demands of the event it's 30k it's flat into a rolling profile as a matter of fact that's the profile that was on this slide right it's, um, it's got some fast sections and it's got some technical sections. So I might just start with the big general demands. I have an estimated time we would expect to finish in it. I'm already kind of thinking those things through. So I start with those general demands. Let's just be general and start big picture. And I have this on my little sheet. I just have these four boxes and I just start filling in my bullets. Then I start talking about the specific demands of the event. Well, you can actually see it here in the profile not to jump back and forth. This has three specific climbs, so that's where I start. So I pulled all data analytics on that, um, looking at what those specific climbs are, what's the grade, what's it, you know, we're starting to talk about gearing and demands and what's on there. But it also has one or two kind of, let's just generally call them tricky descents that we're gonna have to make some big decisions on how fast, aerodynamics, uh, what can we handle and handling, things like that, right? So there, what I do is I'm breaking the course down in this case into very specific segments. And I'm using SART segments. I did a video on this. Um, I'm using SMART segments to break the pieces and parts down to really look at those specific demands. You and your event might have, wow, this, this is a circuit race and it goes up this two minute climb, you know, 11 times. And you have to be prepared for that. That's the specific type of demand. So now you have these external and um, these external demands, which I'm going to get to in a moment, of general and specific. 
Now understand those are external factors, right? Those are your, what you're going to put the athlete, the environment the athlete is going to be performing in. An environment, by the way, I should have commented on this, specific demands of the event. Think about weather, how hot, how much wind, how much other stuff. When you start doing specific, that's where you really can, you know, people don't prepare well enough for stuff like that. Make sure you're adding that type of uh, stuff to your uh, specific demands. That's why I kind of always force myself here to think external. What's all the external factors, environmental factors. Now, as I come around the circle, I'm doing the internal factors. What's going on within the athlete? And here's rider ability, strength, and limiters. So all those notes I've been taking, I kind of record them here. What's strengths, what's, and I really think about what could limit them. How do we win by their strengths? And what weaknesses can develop into limiters on this course in this event? And finally, one I didn't talk about, but I'd be remiss to not say it's not part of my ability. I look at the athlete's psychological focus and motivation. Um, are they totally psyched to do this event? Are, are, do they have the right mindset? Are they motivated to train for it for success? You as a coach, and this is way harder to do as a self-coach athlete. Again, why I really recommend hiring a coach. Um, you're gonna, it's very hard to be objective with yourself about this point. Um, you might believe you're fired up and ready, but there might be some fear. There might be other things. There might be stuff that's more of a barrier that a coach could help you identify that you might not self-identify. My final advice, as I say, is write these down. Just write them all down. The exercise of writing it down will surprise you how effective it is in helping you focus. One of the things when I mentor coaches, I ask them to do this on themselves. So if you're watching this and you want to go through an interesting exercise, you know, grab a cup of coffee and sit down and just create a, just take a piece of paper and put a big X down the middle, right? And create this for you. Just think about you. Don't worry about it. Pick one of the events you do. Don't worry about over accuracy. Just start thinking and then just start maybe looking at your own data. And you might find it takes you much deeper than in your thought process than you've gone before. Excellent. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, in the next couple of days, I'll be releasing lesson three, establishing your training targets.